Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the very first session of Diabetes Day X Health and Wellness Campaign 2022's Online Health Awareness Talk brought to you by the Asian Medical Students Association of University Putra, Malaysia. It is a pleasure meeting all of you. The ceremony will commence shortly, but before we begin the talk session, here are a few important announcements and we hope for your fullest attention. Dear audience, the QR code and the Google Form link will be provided at the end of the talk, so please fill it in within 10 minutes to record your attendance. If you have any questions during the talk, feel free to type it down at the slido.com link provided in the YouTube live chat box, as our speaker will answer your questions during the Q&A session later. Please like and give us some reaction throughout the talk to show your support towards our speaker today. And a kind reminder, you do not need to put your name and metrics number in the YouTube live chat. Also, please follow and subscribe to AMSA UPM's social media accounts as mentioned in the chat box below. Your cooperation today is much appreciated. Good evening, everyone. We proudly welcome you to Diabetes Day Health Campaign 2022, organized by the Asian Medical Students Association of UPM or AMSA UPM once again. Greetings I bid to the committee board of this program, the Honorable Speaker Dr. Mikhail Joseph Anthony, and also to the beloved participants. My name is Tishalini Savaraja, and it is an honor to be your MC for this invigorating health awareness talk, Session 1, Diabetes 101, everything that you should know about it. Before we kickstart our event, let's all hear to the prayer recital by Muhammad Nabil Mukri bin Noor Kamaru Zaman. Al Fatiha. Al 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Hamdan wa fi ni'mah wa yukafi'u mazidah. Ya rabbana lakal hamdu kama yanbaghi li jalali wajhika al karim wa 'azim sultanik. Allahumma ya Allah, on this blessed morning, on this blessed day in conjunction with the health awareness talk session 1. We beseech thee, the grateful towards you in favor of all the infinite blessings to us, your humble servant, to live in safe and prosperous life. We seek your blessing for a flawless progress of this event from the beginning till the end. We seek your guidance to steer clear of event that will detrimental the progress of this event. Ya Latif, Ya Rahman, please bless us with your tawfiq and hidayat. Please guide us to greatness, peace, glory and prosperity in this world and the hereafter. Make us a responsible intellectual. Grant us with a valuable knowledge that will be beneficial to mankind in order to gain your mardatillah. Make us your righteous servant that followed your commands and neglect the sinful act. Please forgive us for our wrongdoing. Rabbana alayka tawakkalna wa ilayka anabna wa ilayka al-masir. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina azab al-nar. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you to our Muhammad Nabil Mukri bin Nur Kamar Zaman for his prayer recitation earlier. Now, allow me to explain thoroughly about the flow of this session to all of you. This program will be kicked off with the very energetic yet informative talk from the Honourable Speaker, Dr. Mikhail Joseph Anthony. So without any further delay, let's get into our session. But just before that, let's all enjoy an exciting promotional video by the Asian Medical Students Association. Asian Medical Students Association Malaysia is the most far-reaching and the oldest Malaysian Medical Students Association established in 1983. AMSA Malaysia has nurtured future doctors to be to disseminate knowledge, undertake creative vocations, conduct community services, and foster new friendships. Now, AMSA Malaysia has blossomed into a member-based, non-profitable, non-sectarian, and non-political organization. With friends and members present countrywide, AMSA Malaysia has new offshoot spreading, which are public relations and alumni, academics and research, multimedia and publicity, public health, and the Asian Medical Students Exchange Program, AMSEP. The fundamentals rooting AMSA Malaysia for its sustenance to this day are knowledge, action, and friendship. Follow us on our social media at Facebook and Instagram. Stay tuned to AMSA Malaysia. Viva AMSA, building bridges, sharing dreams. Now, let us get to know more about our speaker of this session. Dr. Mikhail is a senior consultant physician at the Perak Community Specialist Hospital. He studied his Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery as well as Masters of Internal Medicine in University of Malaya. He was once the head of the Endocrinology Unit, Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences in Serdang Hospital from January 2010 all the way to December 2011. Not only that, Dr. Mikhail was a speaker for Benkil Diabetes in Paramedic Hospital, Serdang, Port Dixon in 2013 and Penyakit Tiga Serangkai, Health Awareness on RTM Radio Pera in 2019. Recently, he was also a speaker for Living with Diabetes by the Persatuan Diabetes Malaysia, Pera. 
His journals are also highly commendable, such as the article of current clinical status and vascular complications of patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus at tertiary hospitals in Malaysia. And do not forget the article about eight weeks of Cosmos Caudatus or Ulam Raja supplementation improves. Dr. Mikhail is also a member of a reputable organizations such as the Endocrine Society based in the US, a member of the Malaysian Endocrine and Metabolic Society, as well as the European Society of Endocrinology. His achievements and contributions to Malaysia's health sciences are highly appreciable. Now, if participants have any questions during Dr. Mikhail's sharing session, please feel free to drop them at the slido.com link shared later. Now, let us all welcome our honorable speaker of this event, Dr. Mikhail Joseph Anthony. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, MC Tisha. And uh, Assalamu alaikum and good evening uh, to everyone uh, watching and listening to this uh, YouTube live. Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Prof. Cha and the AMSA team to invite and give me a chance to talk to my all alma mater uh, UPM. Eh? I've left uh, UPM now for about four years. Uh, I've been with UPM for the last 10 years. So it's kind of a uh, back down to memory lane. Okay, without further ado, I will uh, start my talk. Uh, I will share the slides first and from there I'll go on. Okay. All right, so today I'll be talking on introduction of fundamental basics of diabetes, diabetes 101, everything you should know about it. Okay, if you want to know about diabetes, actually we can have one whole week of uh, seminar or symposium, but this uh, task was given to me just to give you the basics A to Z, what is diabetes? So let's start. So diabetes mellitus is a metabolic disorder, metabolic disorder whereby whatever food we eat in our, in our digestive system gets turned into glucose and later this glucose is used for energy. So that's basic science. And this glucose that has been absorbed from the gut gets into the cells with the help of an insulin uh, hormone. And this insulin is produced in an organ called pancreas, which is situated below the stomach. So the pancreas produces the insulin. The insulin helps the glucose get into the cells. And that's how we get normal glucose control. But in diabetic patient, this homeostasis fails. Whereby what happens is that the insulin that sits on the receptor, the insulin at the cell level, opens up the pathway for the glucose to go in, fails. It's either there's lack of insulin or there's some abnormality on the receptor of the insulin. So this is how we classify whether it's type 1 or type 2. Type 1 is the, are the patients who do not have insulin at all. For some reason, the pancreas fails to produce insulin. Or insulin is present and in abundance, hyperinsulinemia, high insulin levels, but the receptors are abnormal, especially for patients who are obese or adiposity, too much of fat cells, so it fails. Like a key can't get into a keyhole, so it can't open the door to allow the glucose to get in. So, how many people have diabetes in Malaysia? This is a very interesting thing. As we see, based on this graph, since 1960, over the years, the prevalence of diabetes has been actually going up, it's not going down at all. You see, in 1960, we have about 2% of uh, adult population having diabetes. It goes up to about 6.3%, 8.3% in the 1990s. Later in the early 2000s, it goes up to about 15%. And later in 2011, it's about 20%. That was when we were using a cutoff of 30 years old and above. Because we always think diabetes is the disease of the uh, adult. But unfortunately... Over the last uh, decade or so, many people who are 18 years and above also develop diabetes. And if we recalculate the statistics, people who are 18 years and above, there are almost 4 million 
Malaysians who have this disease based on the 2019 NHMS survey. 2011 was 11.2%, rise up to 13.4% in 2015, and 2019 is almost 20%. So we can say one in every five adults have diabetes in Malaysia. So that is actually an alarming figure. So when we project these figures, it's estimated by the year 2045, we will have much higher levels of uh, number of patients with diabetes. From 2017, 425 million uh, people with diabetes may go up to all the way to 629 million uh, people with diabetes in the whole world, global. So now in the global uh, ratio is 1 in 11, but Malaysia is worse, it's 1 in 5. So this diabetes burden is actually affecting all the countries, especially those with low and middle income countries where Malaysia falls into. The most important question everybody will ask, will I get diabetes or who will get diabetes? To answer this question, we need to see who are those at risk. First of all, those patients with BMI that is above the normal recommended BMI. You know BMI is body mass index. How we calculate this, we can use a formula of weight over meter square. And for Asians, we use a 23 as an upper limit cutoff for normal. And anybody who has got a BMI more than 23 is already at risk of getting diabetes. So listeners out there, if your BMI is more than 23, you need to reduce and come back to normal. If your waistline is more than 80 centimeters, if you are a girl, if you are a woman, or 90 centimeters, if you are a man, I know many of you all will be trying to measure your waist now. You can do that later. But if you fall in this category, you are also at risk. Other than that, family history. Family history, of course, we can't change this. It's partly in our genetics. But if you have parents who are diabetes, siblings who are diabetes, very strong uh, family history of diabetes, high chance that you will get diabetes. Sedentary lifestyle. Sedentary lifestyle means that uh, physical inactivity. If we see over the last two years of uh, COVID uh, pandemic MCO period, notice that many patients actually come in with worsening of metabolic diseases, especially diabetes and related disease. This itself shows that the more sedentary we are, it increases the risk of getting diabetes and other metabolic diseases like hypertension, dyslipidemia, heart problems, and stroke. The next risk factor is obesity. Anyone who has increased body weight, especially in a short period, for example, if let's say you are a very active person and all of a sudden you stop exercising, you gain, say, 5, 10 kilos, that is actually increases risk of you developing diabetes and other metabolic diseases. So, Try not to gain too much of weight. If you're already on the obese side or overweight side, try to reduce your weight and try to maintain as close to normal as possible. <clears throat> the other risk is presence of another metabolic disease. Like, uh, I'm sure you heard of Pnyake Tigers Rankai, uh, what do you call this, hypertension, uh, cholesterol problems and all that. So when you get one of these uh, metabolic disease, it will invite the other two friends. They're all uh, like three stooges. They go together. You have one, the other two will follow. It's a matter of time. The only way to uh, prevent this is to actually have a good lifestyle. The other risk factors is presence of diabetes or hypertension during pregnancy. So for women, uh, ladies who were pregnant and if they had diabetes during pregnancy, gestational diabetes or pregnancy-induced hypertension, blood pressure during the pregnancy, after delivery, they have a high chance of getting diabetes and hypertension. You can say the risk can go up to about 30% and above. The other risk factors are very high carbohydrate diet. If you see around us, fast food, uh, mama, uh, most Malaysian food contains high carbohydrate. If you look at all uh, three main uh, ethnic groups in um, Malaysia, the Indians, the Chinese and the Malays, most of our staple food are carbohydrate. We eat carbohydrate for lunch, breakfast, snack, dinner, supper, 
it's carbohydrate. So the more carbohydrate we eat, actually uh, we are stressing our pancreas and we have higher risk of developing diabetes and metabolic diseases. Stress, emotional stress, physical stress also puts somebody at developing diabetes in the future. So enough sleep, enough rest is very important. Other risk factors are hormonal disease like thyroid, steroid disorders, you know, if you have hypothyroidism, if you have uh, Cushing syndrome and all these things, it can lead to diabetes. Drugs and medications as well. Some uh, psychiatric drugs and also uh, steroids can actually lead to uh, diabetes. So these are all the risk factors. If any uh, one has these risk factors, there's always a possibility may end up becoming a diabetic. How do I confirm if I have diabetes? So this is uh, very technical. So normally we need some tools to uh, confirm. We can't just go by symptoms. You need to check your blood. So how do we do this? If you're at home and if you have a glucometer, maybe someone at home is diabetic, you can do a finger prick test. It will just show you that you fall in the category of abnormal blood glucose. But you can't confirm. To confirm, you need to go to the lab and get yourself a proper venous blood. Eh? You take blood from the veins and send for lab test. And the lab test that we send is what we call as fasting blood glucose, fasting plasma glucose. We can do an oral glucose tolerance test whereby the person drinks glucose and then checks after two hours. Or we do a random blood glucose, meaning that there's no fasting involved. At any time, you just walk into the lab and you do the test and they will... Uh, do the blood test for you and the, if the levels fall in these categories that will decide whether you are diabetes or you're pre-diabetes so let's look at diabetes column here so if the fasting blood glucose you fasted for eight hours and you go and do a blood test it is seven millimoles per liter and above you are diabetic and if you did a random test or two hours after a glucose tolerance test if it's 11.1 .1 and above you are diabetes but if you fall below 5.6 at a fasting level and a random level of 7.8, below 7.8, you are normal. But the levels that in between these two range is what we call pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes is important because it's a reversible stage. If someone falls into this category, lifestyle changes can actually push the patient back into the normal group. So this is very important. So you can't just say, oh, I have pre-diabetes. It's just a little bit of sugar. I will buck up later. No, because once you cross over to this group, there's no way going back here. It's one way, one way ticket. Eh? You go this way, no go stand. So uh, besides doing the blood serum blood glucose, you can do a sort of an average blood glucose testing, what we call as hemoglobin a1c hba1c this actually measures the percentage of glucose that is actually adhered, adhered to the red blood cells so it sort of gives you an average of three month uh, sugar control so if the levels are 6.3 and above in malaysia we call this diabetes okay if you fall below 5.7 you are normal and if you are within this range 5.7 to 6.2 you are pre-diabetes so again, the classification is the same, normal pre-diabetes and diabetes. If you look at some of the other uh, international guidelines, they use a uh, 6.5 as a cutoff. But for me, in clinical practice, I don't really look at absolute value. If they fall somewhere around 6.2, 6.3 and 6.5, I will tell the patient that you are almost indefinitely going to get diabetes. You better buck up. So what are the types of diabetes? I mentioned in the early slides that there's type 1, type 2. But there are also other types. So type 1 is about 10% or less, which actually uh, caused by absence of insulin. When a person does not have insulin, maybe the insulin, uh, what do you call it, is lost because of pancreatic uh, damage due to some antibodies destroying the pancreas or surgery, removal of pancreas. So this group actually, generally they are thin, younger people. Whereas the majority of uh, diabetes fall into this category, what we call as type 2. Previous long time ago, they used to call them 
non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus so this makes up most of the adult population and there are small percentage of what we call as uh, lada latent autoimmune diabetes in adults some call it 1.5 type 3 associated with some resistance in the brain aging related type 4 and gestational diabetes so in all these types of diabetes the most common that we will see is type 2 type 1 and gestational diabetes okay the next question how will i feel if i have diabetes okay if somebody already having diabetes now how will they feel they feel okay or they may feel bad okay they may have multiple symptoms some patients may just have one or two symptoms some may actually have almost all the symptoms it all depends when or how long they've been having this diabetes or hyperglycemia high blood glucose in the uh, blood okay they'll feel tired uh, they'll feel tired for no reason they may not have done anything but they're feeling tired they will go to the bathroom and frequent urination polyuria okay and they will always feel hungry what we call polyphagia in medical terms okay and they may also have sexual problems due to erectile dysfunction psychological uh, stress and all they will start losing weight even without trying they might have wound in their legs or uh, hands or they may get multiple infections and these infections don't seem to recover quickly they take longer than usual their vision may be blurred they will feel always uh, thirsty they want to drink so this is what we call as polydipsia they will feel numbness on the feet and hands for no apparent reason this is basically because the nerves on the legs has been affected by diabetes and in women they will get a lot of vaginal infection in men they'll have a penile infection so these are some of the symptoms that a diabetic patient may face besides that in words urinate a lot often at night very thirsty as i said lose weight without trying very hungry blurry vision very tired dry skin the skin will lose its moist and become very dry they will have sores that heal very slowly <clears throat> and if they are type 1 they may actually develop nausea vomiting stomach ache which actually can be a sign of dangerous diabetic complication like diabetic ketoacidosis how do how to get my diagnosis under control so now we roughly know what is diabetes and what are the symptoms somebody might face so now how do we control this how do we manage diabetes well it is actually very simple but at the same time it's very difficult because management of diabetes involves three main things number one is diet number two is exercise physical activity and number three is medication diet with life uh, with exercise we call this lifestyle interventions this 60 percent of the management is the most difficult because it takes a lot of effort from the patient a lot of self-discipline to control the diet and to also initiate exercise the medicine part usually your doctors will give you some medications they will adjust according to your glucose levels so let's talk about diet first so this was uh, a pyramid that we made when i was in upm together with one of our phd student prof log and prof chan so you can see here there are many pyramid uh, food pyramids around so in principle we just take the principle what we need is minimal fat and salt in our diet moderate amount of protein moderate amount of milk products adequate vegetables and adequate carbohydrate when i say adequate carbohydrate carbohydrate should be just enough not more and if we use the idaho plate method which is a nine inch plate we all i always advise my patients to eat half of the plate full of vegetables maybe a little bit of fruits if they don't want to take too much of fruits but vegetables not uh no uh, what you call this uh potatoes potatoes do not fall into this category they come under carbohydrate group and quarter plate of carbohydrate and quarter plate of uh, protein and they can take a serving of milk and, or plain water and they can have a serving of fruit so this is called a balanced diet for a diabetic patient but unfortunately most of us will eat the whole plate will fill of rice and you will find some spots to maybe push in a few vegetables here and there that is malaysian style of eating and 
everyone with diabetes or potential to get diabetes must know your calories. So just because something looks uh, compact doesn't mean it contains very little calories. For example, if you take nuggets, okay, a few pieces of nugget may contain more calorie than actually a bowl of soup or noodles. So you can see here a hot dog, nugget and soup. You see the calorie levels differ despite nuggets might be uh, the smallest among all of them. And they also contain more fat and more salt because they are processed food. And the, the idea of eating in diabetic patients or not only diabetic patients for all of us is to eat adequate, not overeat. So you need to see whether you fall into a sedentary lifestyle group, a moderately active group or a active person, sports person, do activities every day and you go by your sex and age. So let's say you fall in the category of 19 to 30 years old. So some of most of your students, uh, you guys are fall in this category. Eh? So if let's say you are moderately active or you're very active, say you run every day, you go for jogging, you, you know, you sprint, you swim. So you need roughly about 2000 to about 2004 calories, uh, 4000 calories if you're a, a lady. And if you're a man, you need a bit more. You need 2.6 uh, to 3000 uh, calories uh, per, per day. So you need to know your calories as well. All these things, you can get information from your dietitian. The other thing simple, for those people who don't do calorie counting, those, you know, uh, elderly people or those illiterate, not educated people and all that, you can use your hands to roughly estimate how much to eat. Okay, there are a lot of methods like this. Most of these uh, methods are taught uh, by our dietitians. So, a hand, uh, two handfuls of uh, veggie, a uh, fistful of carbs, a palm full of protein, a loose uh, a fist of uh, uh, fruits and a thumb of uh, fat. So this is just prin principles in illustration to show that how easy is it for us to get a balanced diet. The other thing in diabetic uh, diet management is that it's glycemic index. Just because something is small, it doesn't mean it contains low calorie like I mentioned earlier. So again here, something that uh, may taste almost same. For example, if you take white bread and brown bread, they look the same, the size is the same, they may taste roughly about the same, but glycemic index may differ. Uh, a food that contains high glycemic index is not very good for diabetic patients because the sugar rises very fast and drops very fast. So it makes you hungry quickly. Whereas something that contains more fiber has lower glycemic index and it will last longer and keep you more filled. Okay, so that's for diet. So that's diet in a nutshell. So the next thing we, we need to look at is exercise or physical activity. So studies have been done to say that, to show that people will reduce the risk of developing diabetes if they exercise more. So the, the more physically active you are, the more exercises you do, you actually reduce your risk of developing diabetes over the years. So what are the exercises we usually recommend? Because most of our type 2 patients are 30, 40 and above. We don't uh, encourage them to do very aggressive exercises. So you, most of them, we ask them to do brisk walking. Brisk walking, walk fast, like big walk, you know. If they can, they go for cycling, they go for jogging or they go for swimming. They can also do sports, no problem. But... That depends on the individual's uh, stamina and also fitness level. But most patients, we advise them to go brisk walking. And we ask them to start slow and then gradually increase their pace and their duration. So if they've never exercised before, just start 10 minutes daily for a week, then increase to 15 minutes for the following week, and then you go on 20 minutes, maybe two 10-minute sessions until you reach about 150 minutes per week. You can get a pedometer, it's very easily available. You can use your phone and all that. You can check how many steps you're walking. Recommended 10,000 steps per day to be active. Okay, when I used to work in Serdang, when we walk uh, to and fro from there, you can roughly make about five to 7,000 steps per day, eh? just at workplace. So you can play games, you can play sports, if that is, that is your cup of tea. And of course, Make sure that you are physically fit to do anything aggressive. And 
when you're doing exercise, one important thing is that you need to achieve your target heart rate. How do we calculate with target heart rate? There's a formula. You use your age and you minus uh, from 220. So you get a maximum heart rate of, let's say, about 145, 85%. But you don't start so high. If you are just starting into exercise, go for 50 or 60% of your target heart rate. When you are going on a treadmill, you can actually see your heart rate there. Once you reach this target heart rate, maintain that heart rate for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, etc. So that's how you go on a proper exercise protocol. You can always ask your physiotherapist uh, for further details about exercise uh, programs and all that. Consult your doctor before starting on exercise program if you've been a very sedentary person. Okay, there are many benefits of moderate exercise. Besides controlling sugars, you lose weight, you lower your blood pressure, you reduce your risk of heart, you reduce uh, your cholesterol, you increase self-confidence, and you feel good. Okay, so that is two aspects of the uh, diabetic management, which is lifestyle. The next one we will talk about is medicine and targets. I won't go into details of the name of medications because I think that is not uh, for this audience. It's too technical. What I'll, I'll tell you all is that diabetic medications, very, very important. It should be taken during around the time of meal. You don't have your medication like an hour or two before your meal and then you eat after that. So that is wrong. So almost uh, almost all types of diabetic medicine are to be taken before or after food. Some 30 minutes, some just after, some just before. This need to check with your doctors. Say, Let's say, uh, I just give an example. Let's say the medication called glycolazide. Glycolazide is a sulfonylurea. This medication should be taken before. There are some formulation can be taken just before. Some need to be taken, say, 30 minutes before. Uh, so, sulfonylureas ureas uh, work well if it to be taken before. There's another group of medicine called metformin, eh? very popular medicine where it's a first-line medication. That should be taken after food with something, some meal. You don't take that on an empty stomach. Okay, so you need to check with the doctors, uh, the treating uh, nurse, the diabetic nurses, when this diabetic patient should be taking their medications. And... Everyone with diabetes or who's caring for diabetic patient must know the side effect of this medicine. Because when something happens after taking these medications, we need to know whether it is due to the effect of the medicine or is it complications of the diabetes. Patients who are on insulin must be injected on time and proper dose according to prescription and doctor's advice. This is very important. Some, doc some patients, we recommend them to titrate, adjust insulin according to their sugar level but this usually done to patients who really understand uh, the concept of insulin therapy not for all patients so if <clears throat> your doctor did not tell you to adjust the insulin just take what is recommended and proper time most insulin are to be given before some insulin can be given at bedtime or even in the early morning eh? okay so this again depends on the type of insulin Basal insulins are given uh, once a day. Some uh, insulin are given uh, during meal, what we call as prandial insulin. Okay. Besides that, must also check the blood glucose as often as possible to avoid hypoglycemia and to reach good targets. So, you don't take your medication, you don't inject yourself and then just, uh, just uh, do, I mean, you don't just take your medications and inject and hoping your sugar is going to come normal. No, you need to know where you are. So let's say start off with your glucose levels were in the 20s. After taking medication, maybe you have come down to 10, 10 millimoles. So you want to know how you are coming to your targets. Also, if you have experienced hypoglycemia, maybe your sugar drops too fast. So that is actually dangerous. Okay, so to avoid that, every diabetic patient should have a glucose monitoring machine. So this is just to show some photos of how insulin pens are. They're very easily used. Just uh, inject onto the tummy. There are certain spots around the navel or umbilicus that we can inject this uh, insulin. 
So you can see here there are multiple sizes of insulin. Mostly we use 4 mm, some uses 5 mm. And those days when I started working, we were using 8 mm. And, you know, this really scares the patients away. They'll just uh, won't come back to you. Huh? Okay. So this is how you check your uh, blood glucose at home. You can get, this is what we call a glucometer. It comes in different shapes, brands and all that. You can buy one according to your budget. Some has more memory. Some nowadays have Wi-Fi. So it can sync to your phone and an app. The minute you do it, it just comes to your phone. So you just uh, prick at the fingertip and then uh, put some blood onto the tip of the stri uh, strip and then it will give you the reading within a few seconds. Okay, so for targets, uh, normally we do, uh, I don't uh, give uh, blanket targets for all patients, but of course, if you look at the guidelines, they will tell you before meal, it's 4.1 to 6 and two hours after meals are generally up to 8 and HbA1c targets are less than 6.5. But this, uh, we, I will, most doctors who treat diabetic patients will adjust according to the individuals. If they are elderly patients, bed bound, they are really dependent on other people to take care of their diabetes, then of course you don't set too tight uh, control because risk of hypoglycemia is very, very high, especially those patients who are demented, who have very poor memory. Yeah? So those patients, we don't give them very tight control. But if the person is young and very newly diagnosed diabetes, then of course we go for very tight control. And we want the HbA1c to come down as close to normal as possible. So the next thing is, you know about diabetes, you know how to control diabetes. Now what can happen if you don't control diabetes? What can happen if I don't control my diabetes? So this is actually something that we don't want to see, but we do see often in our, in our practice. So diabetes can come as acute complication or chronic complication. Acute means something that happens within a few hours to a few days. And chronic means it happens over weeks, months and years. So acute complications, uh, basically what happens is that in our blood, the glucose level goes very high and there's also formation of acid in the blood. So there's what we call as ketone bodies. And this condition is known as diabetic ketoacidosis. Commonly happens in type 1, but it can also happen in type 2. Especially those patients who come in with severe infection, eh, they can happen. In the US, the mortality rate is 0.2 to 2%. But in developing countries and uh, third world countries, the mortality can go up to 50% depending on the country. There's some data that showed Malaysia range was around 17%, but I think it also depends on hospital to hospital. If you're in a tertiary center, your mortality will be much, much lower. Okay, the other thing that can happen acutely is severe dehydration, confusion and coma. So this condition we used to call, we used to call them honk, but the new term is hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, HHS. And this has a higher mortality, roughly about 10% more than uh, DKA, diabetic acidosis, in the US. And uh, in uh, developing and third world countries, the mortality can go up to about 70%. Again, depends uh, which center the person is being treated. And the, both these conditions will usually require ICU or high dependency care. And patients can be very ill and uh, they may end up having other organ damages, even uh, ventilation on uh, what you call assisted breathing and all that. Chronic complications are the one that we commonly see. And the most commonest is heart attack or in medical terms we call as myocardial infarction. This can happen to patients who have uh, uh, diabetes, especially those poorly controlled with other uh, medic metabolic disease like hypertension, uh, cholesterol problems, dyslipidemia, uh, or maybe if they have uh, obesity and all that, then the risk increases. Okay, and heart attack typically comes on with a central chest pain, and this pain can actually radiate to the inner side of your arm all the way to your little finger and also the face. So if anyone experiences this and if the person is diabetic, 
need to rush to the hospital. Having said that, diabetic patients, because their nerves may be uh, also affected, maybe spoiled eh, because of diabetes, they may not get this typical uh, pain distribution. They may just get some burning sensation at the upper part of the stomach or maybe a bit of numbness on the face or just feel a bit nauseated, want to vomit. And that they can actually have myocardial infarction. I had one uh, patient when I was in Sardang presented by a medical student, UPM medical student, who just presented with some kind of a back pain and it was actually a full-blown myocardial infarction. Okay, so they present very atypical if they have poorly controlled diabetes. The next one is stroke. Okay, so stroke in Malay they call it angin ahma. Uh, some call it hemiparesis, body weakness, and all that. So it can affect the face, the arms, the legs, and also can affect the speech. All this depends which part of the brain is affected. If the stroke or the blood vessel uh, block happens at a lower part of the brain, it can also cause breathing problem and also heart problem, meaning they will end up on ventilator. So this is actually a very, very uh, tragic complication if it happens. Eh? And nowadays, of course, we have uh, stroke, uh, acute stroke centers whereby you can use medication to open up the blocks but uh, it's still sad that throughout the country, many hospitals, we do not have that facility. And many people end up with very bad residual neurological uh, problems. The next thing is uh, peripheral vascular disease. Okay, so similar to the first in the heart, second in the brain, this happens in the legs. So the blood vessels get blocked by blood clots or cholesterol blocks and all that. And the legs become painful. Uh, may end up with ulcer and also the toes may die of what we call as gangrene. Eh? So poor blood circulation and the limb basically dies. Okay, coming, moving down to smaller blood vessels. Earlier we talked about bigger blood vessels. Now we go to smaller blood vessels. The commonest co uh, complication of diabetes is kidney failure. Okay, so when the small vessels in the kidney fails, what happens is that the blood cannot be filtered by the kidney. Lots of toxins actually float around in our blood and it has to be removed manually using machine. Okay, so one of the method is what we call as hemodialysis whereby uh, long uh, big needles have to be injected and to drain the blood and then filtered in the machine. So this is a man just uh, going through hemodialysis. Or another method is that they pump in some uh, fluid into the abdominal cavity and then they drain out the toxins out. So we call peritoneal dialysis. This can be done at home. Eh? So the other one is eye disease, which is also very sad. A person with a normal vision this is what they see. A person with a diabetic retinopathy or damage to the eyes, this is what they see roughly. And eh? so there are many types of damage to the eyes. This is one of it. Food ulcers due to numbness, where this is why I mentioned about the nerve being affected. So once the nerve affected, the person will experience severe numbness. You don't feel, some are so sad that they don't even feel that they are stepping on the ground. So they end up getting all this kind of calluses, which later develop into ulcers. Okay, and the other one is that this, usually people are very shy, men are very shy to talk about it. But this is a very common uh, problem in diabetic patients. And most patients who have sexual uh, uh, dis uh, disorder, such as erectile dysfunction, will, uh, will have some kind of heart disease. Okay, so if you have somebody with heart disease, check for erectile dysfunction and vice versa. So in, in terms of sexual disorder and psychological issues, they'll have inability to have erection and sexual intercourse. They can have uh, genital in infections, you know, recurrent, you treat, it comes back again and again. And the, the thing that we hardly talk about is depression and anxiety. In the early stage, when we diagnose somebody with diabetes, they will have denial, anxiety. Later, they will say, you know, why am I getting this disease? They become depressed. They give up hope. They lose hope. They become uh, very, how you say, uh, very down. They do not want to follow the treatment the doctors give. They usually will default from follow-up. So this is a big issue. Uh, especially in young diabetics because their working group 
And once they la we label them as diabetic patients, they actually go through a lot of difficulties. Okay, so in summary, diabetes is a chronic disease. It affects the whole body, including the mind, the psychology. The management is simple, yet it's difficult because it needs a lot of uh, involvement of the patient. Good control prevents complications. So if the control is done as early as the diagnosis, within one to two years or within five years, we can prevent this complication from happening. Complications can cause a lot of problems. Okay, It causes total change of lifestyle in people, especially let's say they got amputated, they get a heart attack, they get a stroke and all. It changes the lifestyle. So complications cause a lot of problems. So the final advice to all listeners, you know, you can share with people you know who have diabetes or your relatives is that need to know the disease. So you need to get enough information about diabetes from proper channels. Eh? You get from your doctors, from uh, proper uh, societies or diabetic nurses. You get proper information. And you need to get motivated, you know. Okay, you need to see people who have uh, diabetes and they are successful. Don't listen to failure or negative stories. And you need to have self-discipline, okay. You can't change anything, not only diabetic control, you can't change anything in life if you do not have self-discipline. Have reasonable targets, discuss with your health caregiver, your doctors, your, your diabetic nurses, and set targets and try to reach them within the stipulated period. Healthy lifestyle, okay, I mentioned diet, exercise, and regular medical checkup. If you are 40 years and above, at least once a year, but if you have any family members who have diabetes or yeah, if you're younger and you have family members with diabetes, please, you can get yourself checked even if you're only 25 or 30 years old. Okay, with that, I end my talk. Thank you very much. That was such an informative sharing from Dr. Mikhail. Thank you, Doctor. We are truly mesmerized. Now, participants are encouraged to ask their respective questions to our speaker. Okay, so we will now proceed with the Q&A session with Dr. Mikhail. The Slido link will be shared in a little while, so please feel free to drop your questions over there. We have any questions so far? Uh, we do, Doctor, but we will, just, we will just let the tech present the Slido link slide so we can okay. talk about the questions. So there looks to be there's like a lot of questions. So I will choose some uh, questions that seem quite interesting. Uh, doctor, could you explain what is the mechanism that actually causes the glucose tolerance? Glucose tolerance. You mean insulin resistance, is it? I think they do mean uh, insulin resistance, doctor. Okay, all right. Okay, the, there are a lot of uh, theories, lah, but I think the most common insulin resistance is basically because of, because of obesity. Eh? There's a term that we call diabetes. Uh, in people who have uh, uh, increased uh, visceral or internal uh, adipose tissues eh, due to obesity, it actually causes the receptors of the insulin to lose uh, form eh? so that the actual insulin... Uh, uh, molecules can't sit and they can't the key and uh, uh, can't open the channels so that the glucose goes in so this is the the, the most common reason for uh, what you call insulin uh, resistance there are other things like hormonal diseases like you know if you take steroids cushing syndrome uh, other acromegalies other endocrinopathies also can give you high insulin resistant levels no? but uh, in a uh, in majority of type 2 patients are because of obesity. 
Okay, doctor. Understood. Okay. So, uh, the other question here is, good evening, doctor. I heard that you cannot prevent type 1 diabetes mellitus and that getting this disease is a matter of luck. How true is this? <laughs> no, it's not. It, it's, I, mean, I say it's not luck. Okay, let, let's put it this way. Type 1 diabetes is uh, due to, uh, most common is due to autoimmune disease. Okay, and uh, autoimmune diseases uh, may be related with other autoimmune diseases. So like uh, polyglandular syndromes and all that. So if somebody has uh, Addison's disease, so like adrenal gland, you got low cortisol levels or you got Graves thyroid disease or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, then this group of patients, we also usually screen for diabetes or during their routine follow-up, you know. So uh, I wouldn't say it's a matter of luck, uh, but it it's uh, how you say, you can't prevent it, but you can look hard for it, whether it, it's uh, possibly uh, present in certain group of patients. And um, if the person has a twin and the twin is diabetic, then maybe you want to look at the other twin as well, whether they've got diabetes or not. But uh, it's not uh, as easy as uh, type 2 diabetes uh, to, you know, just screen everybody, you know, below uh, above 40 years old or above 30 years old and uh, pick up type 1 diabetes. Uh, young patients, yes. If they are young, then you can screen them. If uh, you think that they have some a telltale signs like, you know, vitiligo, certain signs that they may have some autoimmune disease, yes. But otherwise, uh, uh, yeah, you are right that you can't prevent them. But, uh, yeah, you, you, I wouldn't say it's luck. It's not good luck anyway. It's bad luck. So, doctor, uh, regarding the uh, diabetes that can be inherited, is there any way that we can avoid getting diabetes if, let's say, our genetics show that there's a possibility of developing diabetes? Okay, if it, we are talking about type 2 diabetes, the, the main problem is that it is not one gene that is causing diabetes. Eh? It's multiple genes. So, uh, there are a lot of research going on to find, identify which gene is causing that, uh, the diabetes, and they're trying to come up with uh, therapies and all that. But I think at the moment, it is still lifestyle will give you the best preventive uh, uh, percentage. So there's no other way. If uh, anyone in the family has got diabetes or pre-diabetes, then the other members of the family has to make an effort to change their lifestyle from the beginning. So at least that can reduce. So there are studies were done, you know, uh, showed that uh, lifestyle and uh, changes actually prevented diabetes uh, in a group of study patients up to about 50% as compared to taking medications like metformin to prevent diabetes. So at the moment, it is still lifestyle changes to prevent diabetes. So doctor, regarding that, there's actually a question. Uh, hi doctor, I just wanted to ask if it's good to replace carbs with protein like, a, like what a lot of youngsters are doing nowadays. Okay, good question. Uh, you can, you can replace carbs uh, with proteins, but youngsters, uh, you also need a bit of carbohydrates to uh, give you energy for your workouts and your physical activities and all that. So to cut carbs completely, it's not going to be easier and uh, it's not going to be something um, feasible for a long period. If you're going on a program, you know, weight losing program, you want to Top carbs, go on uh, protein, fine, no problem. But you to sustain no carbs at all, it's going to be very tough. So I usually will recommend take limited carbs or add just adequate carbs. Maybe if you are, you know, running every day or you're going for sports, you know, you just need a little bit of carbohydrate. But you can uh, replace the other part of the carbohydrate with a bit of protein, vegetables, fibers and all that. Okay, no problem. But I, I don't recommend that for long term. Okay, thank you, doctor. So I think there's, a, I think a lot of our audience is actually curious about, uh, you know, having diabetes in different types of patient. In fact, there's actually a question. Doctor, mm -hmm. do you know how to control diabetes in schizophrenia patients who is not controlling <laughs> their sugar intake? Uh, that's a tough one. Huh? Okay. Uh, if you, if, if you heard what I said about diabetic targets earlier, <clears throat> I said, 
if the person is you know having dementia forgetfulness we don't set the targets high this goes for psychiatric patients as well because psychiatric patients especially those with schizophrenia whereby their mental status is not normal this group of uh, patients we do not set a normal target we normally want to prevent them from going into acute complications like dka or hhs and want to keep the sugar just about nice so we need to talk to the caregiver so that's very important you're talking about patients who can't make decisions themselves it all goes back to the caregiver if they got very good family support we can try to bring the targets as close to normal if the caregiver can help but if they do not have a proper caregiver they are institutionalized you know 20 30 people in one uh, unit or something like this is going to be really very tough so this has to go patient i mean uh, individual basis but in principle if the psychiatric problem is not well controlled they do not uh, understand they are completely out the targets we just set so 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 that they don't go into acute complications we don't look for hb once less than 6 or 7 we don't wow okay so this is also my first time actually understanding that um, you can no, check it up know. in uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, you can check check this up in the idf guideline you can look for elderly uh, guideline <clears throat> i can't remember which year was that there was a guideline you can check they classify it very nicely people with uh, uh mental problem patients with a physical problem normal people and all they classify very well you 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 guys can actually check it up thank you doctor so there's also i think questions regarding the complications of diabetes there's actually one uh doctor how common is it actually for patients leg especially to be amputated due to diabetes okay <clears throat> i cannot give you absolute a uh, statistic on percentage because i think it differs from uh, country to country place to place but uh, if the person starts uh, getting ulcers on the extremities on the leg uh, the risk of getting amputated actually sort of relates to the diabetic control if the diabetic control is very poor very poor chances of amputation is high because the necrotic tissue will actually extend even inside become necrotizing fasciitis and all that then so this may even end up getting a bka or a aka you know but if the diabetic control is good generally with very good dressing good antibiotics good diabetic control they usually will heal and we can actually prevent any amputation from so it, it still goes back to overall diabetic control and the uh, side of the wound again if it's on the sole you know there's poor blood circulation <clears throat> then you have to be more careful but if they happen to be a bit on the uh, on the the dorsum or above then <clears throat> it's better and the other thing they need to check is also peripheral vascular disease uh, pre existing together with uh, this diabetic patient poor blood circulation with neuropathy it's a bad combination so this kind of patients also will have high risk of being amputated hi hey, doctor so there's also a question regarding i think i think this patient actually is taking medication for diabetes so the question here goes doctor my glucose level is normal after i've taken medication but nowadays i have found my glucose is rising so should i resume my medication so my level is normal after taking medicine but i, I think this person stopped i guess i have found my glucose rising should i resume of course you should resume your medication if your sugars are going up but uh before that you should ask yourself why is the sugars going up is it because you're not controlling your diet from what i see in my practice more than 50 to 70% of patients do not have good diabetic control because of diet uh they take their medications well but the sugar still keeps on going up by is is diet and most of them are unaware that what food contains glucose what food do not contain glucose carbohydrate they're not sure and i have had patients who you know eat uh, they replace uh, rice with uh, uh, potato and chapati then they say oh how come my sugars are still high they are still carbohydrate so a lot of uh, unawareness uh not informed so these patients actually should look back at their diet 
But of course, for this patient, you should start back your medications. And if you have any problem, you should go back to your doctor. If any medication need to be changed. Yeah, I agree, doctor. I think that's like the best thing to do. So um, there's also a question regarding, I think this is still about the genetics. Uh, they asked, doctor, can diabetes be cured by tweaking with our genetics? As in genetic I hope engineering. So. I really hope so. <laughs> I think that that's all in still in research. They're trying their level best, but I think nothing for the general public yet. But I think they're really hoping to get it done. Like I said, it's a it's 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 multiple gene involved. You see, so you can't really tweak one gene, and it's not as easy as uh, we think. It's still they're trying. I hope so that one day we can we can cure diabetes. Yeah, doctor. There's also one more, I think, regarding the uh, drugs for med, uh, for diabetes. So, doctor, I have a family member who takes more than one drug for their comorbidities. comorbidities. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance for mm -hmm. drug interaction to occur and cause hypoglycemia? Yeah, possible. Yes, definitely. Uh, it, it depends on what medications, but if you take too many uh, anti-diabetics, there's always a risk of hypoglycemia. And uh, there, there are some medications that can cause a hypoglycemia unawareness, you know, your beta blockers and all that. So, yes, definitely can. Uh, but it's just that uh, there's no, not much info given in the question to say whether that particular drug uh, can cause hypo. But yes, if you take too many medications, yes, it can cause. So you have to be very careful. Like I mentioned, you need to know the side effects of all the drugs. So the best person is the doctor who prescribed need to ask them you know whether you can take this together or you should take it separately uh, how to go about the dosing and timing all right i think we are almost near the end there's actually a question uh, so doctor in your opinion why do you think we still haven't found a cure for diabetes after so long i think like i mentioned it it, it is it is partly like a lifestyle disease you know and it, it it's it's caused by multiple uh, genes so there are a lot of uh, theory saying that as we are evolving as we are progressing become more and more urbanized there there are genes that actually help to keep store things you know in our body if, if you realize that uh, over the years uh, obesity is becoming normal in some uh, societies eh? especially in the west and all that that's because we have more than what we need to eat so we have abundance compared to our forefathers who did more physical work and uh, less uh, food to eat. We have more to eat and less physical work to do. So our body is a very good, uh, how you say, a storer. Right? It stores everything. Whatever we eat, it stores. So the more it stores, over time, we genetically also mutate to help store more. So it's not going to be easy. So uh, to, to prevent... Uh, or to stop diabetes is not going to be easy. So the, the, the thing that we can do at an individual level is actually to start changing our lifestyle, choosing our food uh, smart, eat adequate carbohydrates, not too much. If you're doing more uh, sedentary job, you do not eat like have to eat like a, like a farmer. Yeah, you just need a little bit of carbohydrates. So you have to go back to basics. The other things, of course, you know, uh, government, uh, NGOs, they have to come up with, you know, proper... Uh, meal plans for children in school. Recently, they're talking about obesity in, in schools and all that. So all these things has to be tackled at a, at a higher level. So it, it's, it's multifactorial. It's not going to be as easy as that. That's why until now, diabetes cannot be, cannot be cured. So the thing that we can do is at least on our part, as you know, future doctors and, uh, and, and, and future generation, we have to just control the lifestyle. That's what we can do at the moment. All right. I think this concludes our Q&A session, Doctor. So thank you to Dr. Mikhail for the priceless information and also informative answers. And thank you to the audience for giving us such amazing questions. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Amsa UPM, uh, for inviting me. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Disha. So um, I would say now let's move on to our next agenda, which is the presentation of the e-certification. Right, so as, 
As a token of our appreciation, we are really honored to present this certificate to Dr. Mikhail for his collaboration in this event. And it was really an interesting and enlightening sharing session just now. Thank you, Doctor, for being able to share all that you know with us in today's Diabetes Day campaign. And I am sure the public and all the students who listen to our talk will have a better understanding about diabetes. And for that, we thank you, Doctor, sincerely. Okay, thank you so much. As a way to capture this momentous memory, let us all have a short photo session together. So Dr. Mikhail and all the AJKs are highly encouraged to turn on their camera for this photography session. Thank you everyone for your cooperation. Right, so one, two, three. All right, I think okay. that's enough. All right, so now it is time for us to depart from our speaker, Dr. Mikhail Joseph Anthony. Okay. Thank you so much, doctor. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Now, we are very pleased to inform you that AMSA UPM's Diabetes Day 2022 has organized an infographic competition in conjunction with the Health and Wellness Campaign with the theme surrounding ways to prevent diabetes. So don't forget to join us and participate in this competition. We are also excited to announce that AMSA UPM's Diabetes Day and Health Wellness Campaign 2022 will be having another online health awareness talk session two with the theme, Know Your Enemy, Let's All Beat Diabetes by Dr. Lechman Ramanathan. Now, not to forget, AMSA UPM is also organizing a virtual fun run, which is the perfect opportunity to boost your endurance. All you have to do is track your running progress with tracking apps such as Ad Health, Samsung Health, or even Google Fit, and sync it to the Book Doc app. For further guidance, do refer to the link provided in the YouTube chat box below on how to use the promo codes associated with the Book Doc app. So what are you waiting for? Put on your best pair of running shoes to stand a chance to prove to yourself that being fit can prevent diabetes. So there's a lot waiting for you. So grab this chance and let's all try to learn a little bit more about diabetes. Attention to all participants. The QR code will be projected on this next screen for the attendance. Only those who have filled up this form will be rewarded with the early certificates and merits. For those unable to scan the QR code, the post registration link will be provided in the YouTube comment section. And just a reminder, the post registration link will only be open for 10 minutes. Thank you everyone for attending this session today. Do like and share our recorded video with your friends and family members who might have missed the session so that they too can gain benefits from this. And with that, we thank you for attending today and we really hope to see you soon. Thank you.